All right, it's another beautiful Sunday afternoon. This is Robin Minds. Welcome. My name is Abu Ka Obiuchi, and thanks a lot for joining us today. Um, we're going to be kicking off the show talking about education. Um, it's something that I think uh, if you're a constant viewer of Robin Minds, you know how very passionate we are about this uh, particular sector of our nation because uh, with, uh, it's, there's no gain saying the fact that it's at the root of a lot of the issues we have in Nigeria today, and it's not looking very pretty for uh, a lot of the statistics we see with out-of-school children, girl-child education, uh, just sort of the quality of education we even tend to see these days, even at the tertiary level. So it's, uh, I think it's, it calls for very, very serious concerns. Uh, and we uh, are not sure where Nigeria is officially with regards to the government and uh, its position in a lot of these issues. Politics is fast approaching. We have a presidential election coming up uh, in, at the early months, I believe, of 2020. 23, and you know, once elections are around the corner, the year before that is filled with politics. So, how much is this going to affect education? Um, this is also very important because on Tuesday, the 5th of October, was World Teachers' Day. And um, I don't know that we saw a lot of things happening in this part of the world, uh, but I'm going to be speaking with people who probably know better than I do on these issues. Falawe Mikuli is here with me. Thanks for coming. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. Yes. What was different about this year's World Teachers Day, if anything, and how, of what significance uh, is it, especially with Nigeria and you know, where we are today, which education? Mm -hmm. So when you think about the theme you know, for this year's World Teachers Day, um, it says the teachers at the heart of, of recovery. And so when you think about the year that we had in 2020 coming out of the pandemic and when the schools were locked down, you know, we realized um, the, the responsibility or we realized, you know, just how important the teachers are. You know, we saw that countries that continue to function or education systems that continue to function, you know, it, a lot of it was because the teachers were able to continue to, you know, carry out remote teaching and learning. They were able to continue to engage their students. They were able to engage their students, not only in the academic, but social emotional um, skills and learning as well. So when you think of recovery, Right. I think it's that we came out of there, if we didn't recognize before that the teacher's role was irreplaceable and super important, I think that period showed that to us. And so with the theme for this year, it's recognizing and saying to everyone, guys, we really need to be investing our resources in teachers. We need to be supporting them to deliver on the learning goals that, you know, we've set for ourselves as a country and as, you know, as a whole, as a world, you know, so I, I think that conversation needed to happen. Yeah. But then to your point, you know, how many, so, you know, I saw, the, you know, the federal government, for example, announced on the teacher day that um, we're going to ha start having you know, 75,000 are paid to um, um, undergraduates at the university level who are studying education. And then at NC level, we're going to start paying 50,000 are all in the sort of like in, in the clamor for improving the quality of individuals and of, of people who are going into these um, programs. You know, then there's been lots of debates around there where it's like, how did we really think about this sort of like intervention? How did we, did we think about it in the total? Because when you think about sort of, trying to improve on quality. It goes beyond just paying, you know, to paying um, to graduates, to, you know, to attract people because there's so much more that needs to happen. Yeah. For example, the people you're trying to attract, does it still mean that you're not going to, like when you think of jam and people who need to go and study education, all you need to score is 100 or 120 over 400 and you get into an education program at the university level. And so if that doesn't change, you're still not going to attract the best and the brightest. Yeah. If we do not articulate the vision of education for Nigeria, what is the purpose of this education? What, what, how, does it, how is it relevant to us? What do we want to see at the end of 10, 20 years? What is our plan? And we haven't done that as well. So we don't really have a vision that attracts people to join the teaching force. We also don't have a system in place that'll actually recruit, attract those individuals, retain them, train them properly. And so, you know, all of that needs to be looked into. And I think this is one of the things that I always say, like there's not, there's not one single solution. And I think we keep throwing interventions into this. And that's why we keep coming back to the same conversation because we need to tackle this from like different angles. But to my point again, you know, the theme for this year, 
I think it's shown to us how important teachers are. We really need to invest in our teachers. I think with that, we would see some returns if we're attracting the right teachers, if we're supporting them, if we're motivating them, if we're really training them and investing in their you know, ongoing training and even pre-service training before they go into the schools. And I think that really is what this World's Teacher Day you know, sort of revealed to us. I like the fact that you talked about training there a lot because, I mean, we, if you have any idea what the private sector looks like, it's one thing that, you know, employers of labor are very particular about. Even if you had a first class in whatever it is you studied, after some time you need to go for retraining because the world keeps changing. We don't seem to have that a lot, especially in public schools here. So besides the 75,000 or 50,000 mm -hmm. we're getting for mm -hmm. people to get into the, 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 the profession, are we doing enough of that? Because we've seen some, some states where, you know, governors made teachers write primary four mm -hmm. exams and mm -hmm. the pass rate was like 20% yes. or 30% yes. or something as ridiculous yes. as that. Yes. Is there training happening? Do you see any sort of move from government to even introduce that? People are also asking, is this the time for government to hand over education and hand over these public schools, mm -hmm. you know, to people who can run education? Mm -hmm. But how does that work? Because you also need public schools to be free to an extent, or at least affordable. Is there any light at so the end I've of all this? So I've been privileged you know, enough to be, to, to be part of gatherings and spaces where I've engaged with public teachers. And it's very heartbreaking when you hear some public teachers say to you, public school teachers say to you, I've been in this profession for 17 years and I've never had anything like a refresher training. You know, you'd even hear head teachers say, I've been working in the school system for 20 plus years, but I've never had a training that has helped to transition me from a teacher to becoming a head teacher. And so in terms of training, like in-service training that we're providing to our teachers, it's not strategic. We don't have enough. It's not reflective of the kind of skills that we want to develop in our students. We're saying that, you know, I mean, you hear, you know, employers of labor talk about Nigerian graduates being unemployable. So it's not that we don't have the pool. It's not that we don't have the human resource. But they're saying that the skills that they require, you know, these guys have gone through the school system, they've gone through the university, and they still do not have the skills, you know, that would allow for them to employ them. But it's also because we haven't trained the teachers differently. So you want um, graduates who can think critically. You want graduates who can problem solve, or students who, you know, citizens who can problem solve, who can innovate, who can communicate. It's like all of those basic skills, they do not have it. Now, if we're not training our teachers to teach, you know, so that those certain skills are developed, so that, you know, for example, a teacher teaches math, we're not asking that you go there and teach formulas, but how do you teach your student to think mathematically, right? And those are the things, but we, we you know, we're still very teacher-centric and teacher-focused. Yeah. We're not thinking about how to sort of like foster all of this. So if we're not training those teachers in that way, there's no way that we're going to get that result, you know, at the end of this. So we haven't scratched the surface. A lot of um, individuals, a lot of, um, you know, private individuals, social innovators and entrepreneurs are doing some really interesting things. And there are examples that I've seen where they're providing, you know, in-service training. And I, I, I must say that, you know, it's very impressive to see that even public school teachers are taking ownership of their own learning during yeah. times like this. And they're also like just going to, you know, engage with those trainings, whether they're being sent by, you know, the government or not. But I think that, you know, for us to train in mass, I think that government needs to look critically as to and how we're training yeah, and be more deliberate, deliberate about it. You know, about we're, it. we're joined in line right now by uh, Kola Tubosun, uh, who's a writer and a linguist and an educator. Thanks a lot, Kola, for joining us. Uh, we did hear from the Minister of Education um, saying that um, out-of-school uh, numbers for children has dropped from 10.1 million in 2019 to 6.95 million in 2020. A little curious for a lot of people, considering the fact that 2020 was the one year where School almost was not in session anywhere in the country or around the world even. Um, also, when you see all the, you know, we see the reality around us. The number of people we see on the streets begging uh, seems to be quadrupling by the day. But that's besides the point. What are your thoughts on that, first of all? And secondly, um, are the numbers of uh, people in school more important than the quality that we should be getting? Um, thank you for having me, Ibuka. Um, of course, the quality is the most uh, important. You want to make sure that people who go to school have access to the best quality education, um, that they're, they're taught by the best trained teachers. Um, but also you want your citizens to be well educated. Um, a well educated uh, citizenry is a more informed one. Um, so, and we have a lot of people who don't have money to pay for, like you said, uh, many of the 
expensive or public uh, private schools we have around. Um, but I think um, it's important for government to, to invest, like your uh, first guest said, uh, in a lot of training for teachers. Um, but there's also another angle that I've mentioned in the past that um, seem to be easily dismissed, uh, I think because of the way our educational system has been structured, and that's the matter of language. Um, most, um, you know, our educational system is centered around the British style, and, you know, we, we insist that the, the students learn through a certain uh, uh, way. But education is not just about the language in which you teach them. Education is about imparting knowledge and helping students be able to, to, to solve solve real life problems so i think um maybe it's a it's a thing that can be solved by devolving the the uh, the, the 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 system of education to like state and local government but if we think of more alternative ways of teaching uh, students not just english uh, maybe we can have even more people get educated their tech skills there are um, a number of other skills that can be taught without always uh, focusing on the british english uh, style and syllabus you know, I'm, I'm, I'm virtually very excited that you mentioned that, and it's something I've always been very curious about. I mean, you can teach people in their language and still have an English language class. But, I mean, that's exactly. very debatable now, considering the kind of uh, country we live in where English is seemingly very important to everybody. But um, I want to talk about food now, because even in the United States, I was watching, I think, about a week or two ago, there was a debate nationally, basically, about, you know, how, you know, providing lunch for, st for pupils in, in primary schools in, in America uh, could be the, the germ that they want to see with education. It's something that's happened here, a bit controversial for some people. People say, you know, you want to give them food just to come to school. But it obviously has some merits to that. Is that something we should pursue more strategically, you know, to, to, to see probably an improved uh, number of people enrolled in schools? And of course, talking about, you know, style of education, Finland always comes to mind, where people are now taught I don't know exactly how it works, but basically from a very young age, you are allowed to learn what you want, uh, if you know what I mean. So you're not going to go to school. I mean, I'm a lawyer. I was never in interested in introductory technology, for example, or intro tech, like we called it in school then. But I was made to study it. Are we ever going to get to the point where you allow children to actually do the things they are interested in, as against just giving them this thing that they must do? Yeah, I think there is a, a, a lot of space for improvement. There's so much uh, we can do to innovate and rethink the way we consider education in Nigeria. We've always thought about it the same way British have. Like you mentioned the, the thing about introtech. It, it reminds me of a, um, my own experience teaching. I taught English in high school for three years. Um, and I always wondered even for myself, uh, the subject of grammatical names and function, for instance, how many people actually need it in real life? Um, and I had to teach them that. Not just that, even the, the way we structured the syllabus. So the English, um, the British English styles uh, are still what we teach in oral English. You know, we teach oral English and we say you have to speak. There's go, there's mo, and all those, all those things. And students laugh about it because they don't speak like that when they come out on the street. So we are putting so much effort in different directions that are actually not relevant to students' lives. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunities that exist that we can think about a little bit. You mentioned food. Um, when, I, when I was a teacher at uh, White House School in Lagos, um, one of the things I told my students was that they could eat in the class if they wanted to, because there was this rule about you can never eat in class, et cetera, et cetera. My, my judgment was always, you can eat as long as you don't disturb every other person. Right? You know, there's nobody else trying to take food from you or anything. If you don't distract any other person, because I'd gone to school in the US and teacher was in class, Many of the students I taught were, you know, had two jobs and three jobs elsewhere. And you couldn't stop them from eating because you were also denying them, you know, a chance to maybe the only time they had to eat. So food is a very good opportunity, I, I think. Um, providing school lunch is a very good one. Um, but also rethinking the way we insist that students have to learn. It's not making them not eat in class is not what's going to make them focus on what you're teaching them. <laughs> you just have to rethink your, your, your idea of what education should be. I think we're still, still tied up with this idea that, you know, if it's not this strict, punishing, real, uh, uh, you know, structured uh, regime, then you're not imparting education. I don't think that's the case. Uh, and the opportunities exist for us to think and, and do better in the future. All right, I'll come back to you, Colin, now, but I want to ask you a question. I know you want to jump in on the food conversation, yeah. but we're almost out of time. Okay. So let me just quickly okay. ask a question as well, because I want to talk about private schools. Okay. It seems like the public schools always get a lot of flack, mm -hmm. you know, like they have all the, mm -hmm. all the sins, mm -hmm. you know, in that sector. But private education in Nigeria as well, because it's so much, it's literally everywhere mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. and it has sort of almost replaced, you know, what public schools used mm -hmm. to be. There's almost a fear that there's not enough regulation mm -hmm. of what happens there. Mm -hmm. You know, we've had cases of people 
graduating in flying colors, mm -hmm. but going to university and can't seem to pass a course mm -hmm. because schools give you this grade so mm -hmm. that they seem more attractive. Mm -hmm. You know, there's all of these stories mm -hmm. we hear about private schooling. What's happening with regulation there? Mm -hmm. Is it still the best option, mm -hmm. you know, for students while you're weighing on food as quickly as sure, you can? Sure, 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 sure. I'll touch on food real quick and I'll touch on food, you know, just from, you know, the what I've seen when what I've experienced. So the school feeding program, which was launched, you know, a few years ago, a lot of northern states participated. Yeah. And I had a chance to actually see how it impacted because the truth of the matter is there's too, too many poor people in Nigeria. And so poverty is also one of the reasons why parents do not allow their children to attend school. So they rather keep them at home, you know, to work help with work and, and on business. the farm and things like that. So yes, it's, you know, it's definitely a great solution, but your question around the strategy. So we had a situation in, in Kaduna State where one school, you know, where they started to do to run the school feeding program had it used to have like 3,000 plus students. And once they introduced the meal program, the population job jumped on, onto almost over 30,000. I kid you not, kids were sitting on the fence, on the floor. There was just not enough classrooms. They didn't have enough teachers. And so when we think about it, it's a solution in itself, but we need to ensure that we think about it holistically, holistically. you know, yeah. so that we're able to, you know, benefit from the reward of that solution. Now, talking about private school, you know, I think it's a... It's almost like a South thing where we see a lot of like, you know, in, in Southern Nigeria, we see a lot of private schools. It's, you know, it's like on every street that you go into. And, you know, we don't see it in some other regions across Nigeria. And again, I think parents are the ones, you know, it's a demand that is also requiring that the schools are being set up because people just want, they want quality, like regardless, and they're willing to pay. Even the bus conductor would rather send their child to a low-cost private school because he just feels like, you know what, his child is getting a better, you know, support and what have you. But to your point around regulation, I think there is still so much that the government themselves are not doing in their own schools, that sometimes it might be difficult to really fully regulate the schools. Yeah. So there are lots of schools that are not registered. There are schools that are running. And if we were not able to properly capture data, and this is where data also comes in, how do we get them to register? How do we identify the schools? And also, I mean, if we're fair, these schools are also helping the government because if they didn't exist, you know, all of this, you know, what will be happening in the public schools, you <laughs> yeah, know, we true. say there are not enough classrooms and all of that, but is there a way whereby we can find how to regulate them? We can find how to ensure there is a minimum level, a standard, you know, that all schools are adhering to. We have monitoring systems in place. We're investing in them as well and supporting them and not saying, oh, because it's, it's a private school and they're private businesses, it's not yeah. our business as well. So I think it's important that it's looked at in that way, you know, but um, I don't know that we fully, like, the capacity within government to really look at it in that way and then provide solutions and support to all of these schools that also exist. Kola, um, just a final word from you, Kola. Um, we have a government that came into power and, you know, they basically said there were three major areas they were going to be looking at, the economy, security, and, you know, um, I think the economy, I can't remember now. But education didn't feature, basically. And, um, you know, you look at this government, we have about a year plus uh, to go with this administration. How would you, uh, are you optimistic that the coming months might uh, show some more interest in the <laughs> sector? <laughs> no, it's, it's hard for me to be optimistic about this particular government uh, relating to education, unfortunately. But it's not just this government. Um, we have kind of a blind side to Nigeria about education. And like we've been talking about since the beginning, there's a lot of rethinking that needs to happen. Um, and it needs to happen, you know, way from the top. And much of it, some of it have to, you know, actually be taken away from the federal government totally. Because education in some places is a local issue, it's a local government issue. Yep. But of course, we know how local governments are in Nigeria as well. So, um, I, yeah, not dependent on the federal government, but of course, there's still some parts of them. There, there's just a lot of a lot of work for them to do as well. Optimistic. So my own optimism <laughs> comes from young Nigerians like Kola, myself, and lots of people that I just see every day who are doing work in their own way. You know, social entrepreneurs who are coming up with all sorts of innovations. You know different ideas to really support the education system. I get my optimism from there. 
the government in itself and just what they should be delivering on when I think about 2030 goals, which is just around the corner, nine years from now, and if we were on track to really attaining sustainable, equitable, universal education for all, you know, we're definitely not, not on track. Right. You know, there's <laughs> no vision, there's no, you know, there's, so, no, plan. there's no plan, there's exactly. no vision that everybody can keen to say, this is where we're going for education in Nigeria. Right. So that doesn't give me much hope. But then the young Nigerians who are doing incredible work it's you know, always, within the system gives me a lot of It's always the young hope. Nigerians that yeah. seem to be doing yes. all the work everywhere. Thank you very much for that. Thank you very much, Kola, for joining us. Uh, we're going to take a break now and come back. Please don't go away.